On the 15th of November, 1968, the Irish Rose left the port of Dublin on its way to West Africa. The ship carried a load of food and other supplies for the victims of the Nigeria Biafra War, and its cargo included milk powder, salted fish, potato flake, tin meat, blankets, clothing and medical supplies, all of them donated by the people of Ireland. The Irish Rose was the third shipload of supplies sent out of Ireland in the last few months through the agency of the Joint Biafra Famine Appeal. The Irish contribution has been a part, and a very important part, of the stream of goods and money that have been channeled into Biafra through the nightly airlift. It's no exaggeration to say that during the past six months, these night flights to Uli and the ships that provisioned them have kept a whole people alive. On the 30th of May 1967, the independence of the Republic of Biafra was declared. I won't say that a new country was added to the map, since few mapmakers thought it worth their while bothering with the country, which seemed certainly doomed to early annihilation. But today, the Republic of Biafra still survives, despite the loss of five-sixths of their territory, the loss of all their big towns, despite 18 months of continuous warfare, despite the death of hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of their fellow citizens. The people of Biafra are still independent. The roads are thronged with refugees. Hunger and poverty are everywhere. One thing alone remains undiminished, the sheer naked will to survive. Every aspect of life in Biafra today is dominated by the fact of war. At Esnehita, for instance, mass is usually said in the open air. The church is far too small to hold the congregation, especially since everyone wants to attend the earliest mass for fear of the bombers that come over as soon as the sun is fully risen. Today is a feast of Our Lady, and there's especially large attendance. The sermon is in praise of the Uma Mary girls, the members of the Sodality of Our Lady. And our own Mary girls at the moment are engaged in just that type of work. Many of them are helping in the feeding centres. More than half of the people of Biafra are Christians, and among them, Catholics form by far the largest group. The foundations of the church among the Igbo people were laid by an Irishman, Bishop Shanahan, in the early years of this century. His work was continued by other Irish priests and nuns, and they built up an impressive network of churches, convents and schools, extending over the whole Igbo territory. Nearly all of them belonged to Bishop Shanahan's own order, the Holy Ghost Fathers, or to the sisterhood he founded to work here, the Holy Rosary Nuns. The outbreak of the war brought many problems for the missionaries. As the federal Nigerian troops advanced, the Igbo people fled in front of them, and the priests and nuns who had worked with the Igbos moved with them. Some of these displaced missionaries have since returned home, but enough have remained to ensure that all the missions and convents in Biafran held territory are fully staffed. The emphasis of their work has changed greatly, however, and with all their schools and colleges closed, they find that most of their time is spent in bringing relief to the sick and hungry among their people. In the little village of Amimo, the Oma Mary girls are celebrating the feast day in their own way. Since the fall of the town of Oweri, Amimo has become the centre of administration for what is left of the Oweri diocese. Bishop Joseph Whelan, the Bishop of Oweri, moved here after the capture of the city in September, and he was joined here a few days later by the nuns from the Holy Rosary Hospital at Emakuku. Well, I felt very happy that the nuns took the same decision that we did. They decided that it was their place to stay with the people. And even when they evacuated Emakuku Hospital, which was their first foundation in Oweri, and we called it the mother of all the churches, 
when they evacuated their big hospital, they came down here to a MIMO, and six have actually remained on, two of whom are sister doctors. And they usefully put down their time now looking after the sick, visiting the bush, visiting the camps. What effect is, has the war had on your relationship with the people here? I understand at the beginning of the war that things were rather unpleasant for the missionaries. They were unpleasant because all white men were identified with Britain and Britain was the enemy. But people soon began to see that we, the missionaries, were staying with our people, that we were anxious to help them, that we were a consolation to them. So they welcome us now, as you can see here today. And also, of course, you're a provider of food. Oh, we are providers of food for them. We have our feeding centers, and we have helped in a big way to overcome the famine. When you left the Diocese of Awari, or rather the town of Awari, you left it at a time when it was very hopeful for the future, just building your cathedral. What were the circumstances of your leaving, actually? Well, the military circumstances were that our own army had no arms or ammunition to defend the town, so the town fell really without a shot. And uh, our people had evacuated on the Friday and the Saturday. Sunday morning after Mass for some of the military, I left myself. And that was one of the saddest experiences of my life because for 20 years I have been bishop here and built up the diocese, built up a cathedral, a whole education center, a whole center of administration. Then in one day, it's all lost. One of the few things salvaged from the fall of a wary was this machine for making altar breads. The machinery was imported from Italy just before the war began and has been in continual use ever since. The war has obviously made no difference to the deep faith of the Igbo people. Working at full capacity, these girls can produce a quarter of a million communion hosts every month. But even at that, they only barely manage to keep pace with the needs of the Oweri diocese, and the other four dioceses in Biafra have to provide their own supply. The nuns from Emakuku Hospital are now living in a small house at Amimo that was once a teacher's residence. From here, the sister doctors set out each day to visit the refugee camps in the neighborhood. In the last year, the population of Amimo has jumped from 12,000 to more than double that number, as the refugees have continued to flood into the district. The sisters, who are refugees themselves, can sympathize with their plight. Do you remember much of the journey? Was there, was there tremendous congestion on the road? Well, for two days before we left in Makuku, the refugees were on the road day and night. Cars were, were absolutely whizzing past all night. Re then most of the refugees were um, travelled by, by foot, as they say, or on bicycles. And it was usually a man wheeling the bicycle and a baby on the back, with, or the mother on the back with a baby in her lap and a baby on her back and then another baby on the handlebars, and they usually had a goat or two attached to the back of the uh, bicycle. And that was a steady stream all along. It was just pathetic. Even some of the mothers just couldn't take the whole of their families and lost some of the children on the way, because there was a lot of bombing that uh, these few days, you see. And they would be walking along the road, and the next thing the jet would come overhead, and everybody ran for bush, and in the scurry they often lost their children. And we, we got two of children that were just left behind like that on our way to a Mimo. And you took them here? And we took kept them, them here, Father, and kept them for a while. We haven't got a hospital here now. We just do bush work. But uh, we kept them for a while because we have a few beds in the boys' school. We keep bad patients. And when these children got a bit better, we moved them to a Mimo hospital. So you've been completely uprooted from your hospital and you've had to adjust Absolutely, to a new Father. kind of life. What are you Absolutely. doing here in, in a Mimo? Well, we had to form our policy when we came to Amimo, you see, because there were six of us and we had been used to a very well-run hospital. We had a training school for general nurses and for midwives. And um, after much consultation with uh, parish priests and the bishop and the welfare officers and the government, we decided that we would go in for social work and, you know, village visitation in a big way. 
So we decided that we would first do this area of a Mimo, which comprises of five villages, and each village has about seven compounds, you see. And in each of these compounds, there are, well, anything between 600 and 1,000 people. So we decided that we would see everybody in each compound, uh, whole families together. The refugee camp at Ugiri is only about four miles from Amimo, but this is the first time that they've had a visit from a doctor. Understandably, it's not too easy to keep them in an orderly line as they await their turn to be examined. It may take several days, but Sister Doctor intends to examine every man, woman and child in the camp, taking them in family groups. She's not feeding. No. But we'll arrange for her to feed at the centre. Mm -hmm. Don't walk again, Yegi. You come out of the room, and I'm not a room, and I'm not going to be able to. Give her that nurse. I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm 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 going to be able to do it. Thank you. There are nearly a thousand refugees in the camp, and there's hardly one that's not in need of medical attention. The disease of kwashiorkor, which is caused by lack of protein food, is widespread, especially among the children. Where's his family? Kevin Dibegina. His wife has died? Yes. And the children? And the children? And the wife, my wife. Sister, the children and the wife died from Kwashio. Oh, yeah, go on. But two for your sister and I got wrapped This man is the sole survivor of his family. His wife and children have all died from Kwashiorkor, and he himself has the distended stomach and swollen legs that are a sign of the disease. Medicine, by itself, is of no use to him. Unless he can be given the protein food that he lacks, he will certainly die. <laughs> We come to see his nurse at the center. Us nigga be na center eh. Ke bi afukwa na anyi. Now, bring that down now to nurse. The refugees in this camp are from the Port Harcourt area and somehow it adds an extra dimension of pathos to the scene when one learns that many of them are professional people, teachers, bank officials, civil servants. In Port Harcourt they had comfortable homes, cars, fridges, television sets. Here at Ogiri, even the barest essentials of food, clothing and shelter are lacking. At the Holy Rosary Hospital in Ihala, the roofs of the buildings are covered with palm leaves in a not very successful attempt to hide them from passing bombers. But at least the buildings are still standing and the hospital still functions. All day long, the lorries roll up to the hospital entrance filled with new patients, wounded soldiers from the battlefield and civilian victims of the bombing and shelling. There are no ambulances and the wounded are laid on the bare floorboards. To save precious petrol, the lorry waits until it's full before making the journey to the hospital. The long delay and the journey over rough bush roads does nothing to improve the condition of the wounded. The doctors, who are all Biafrans, work wonders under impossible conditions. There's a shortage of food, medicine and equipment. The lights in the operating theatre fade up and down when the generator runs short of fuel and the surgical instruments are sterilised in a pot over an open fire. Yet on one night recently, 120 operations were performed in the hospital, many of them involving amputations of limbs and other major surgery. One lorry has barely finished unloading before another draws up with a new set of patients for the hospital. 
a new set of problems for the matron, Sister Gronje. You have a huge number of patients mm -hmm. here. Have you enough facilities to deal? I mean, obviously, in terms of wards, you don't, because mm. they're out in the verandas. No, oh, they're on the verandas, they're under the beds, they're on the beds, they're every conceivable place. Even the premature nursery is now full of soldiers. Every place. What sort of problems does this cause from the nursing point of view? Well, it's very difficult. Uh, if you have overcrowding, it's very difficult to nurse the patients properly. I mean, for instance, doing dressings on patients under beds is very difficult. And I mean, if you have many of those, the nurses' backs are ready to break by the time they come to the end of them. And it's, it is difficult. And they, they seem to be a very brave fellows. Mm. The patients themselves, or oh, even they are. They are. They are. They are very, very. They I mean they seldom complain. The, the only ones who complain are those who are getting better. When they're really sick, they never complain. <laughs> How are you managing to feed them? Well, uh, really it's the Red Cross are responsible for that. The feeding, I must say, hasn't been all that very good. But uh, How do you mean hasn't been all that good? Well, they haven't been able to get the things. You see, the, the season, the, the, the food that they eat most is yam. And the yam season has only come in recently. And before that, uh, when the yams were scarce, everything, they couldn't get anything to, instead of it. But now when they have yam, it is better but uh, they only get fed once a day, one meal a day. But surely one it's meal. very hard for people to recover mm. from sickness on that sort of diet. It huh? is, but uh, what we do is we, we give them free milk. We get free milk in from the Caritas and French Red Cross, and we give them milk as often as we can, and uh, stockfish. And Apart from these sort of problems of overcrowding, you have the problem of danger in terms of air raids. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see you have mm -hmm. a lot of camouflaging around, mm -hmm. and you have bunkers yes, dug yes. here for... Well, uh, since the day we were bombed, I mean, everybody is more or less a bit on edge, and almost every day we have planes, enemy planes, cr passing overhead. But uh, the hospital itself actually was bombed. It was, was it? actually. It was How bombed. How did that happen? It happened. Um, it was uh, the fourth of September. It, oh, it just happened one morning about eleven o'clock. Nobody was expecting anything. We heard all right that there was an enemy plane at Osuolo, but we never suspected for a moment that we would be bombed. And uh, about eleven o'clock. This MiG fighter just swept over the hospital, ran three times and strafed, and it happened so quickly. It was all over before we realised just how much damage had been done. How much had been done? Were people killed, actually? Oh, there were. There were, I'd say, up to about... Um, in the marketplace, I'd say, many, many were killed in the market. In the hospital, not so many, maybe up to about 15. But little children were killed. And was damage done to the wards and to the buildings? Mm -hmm. The children's ward was the worst. Children's ward got a uh, rocket right through the roof. There was a mother and child killed in bed. And another child was killed in another ward. And another child was cut in half up behind the kitchen. What happened to the hospital after this? How did the people react? Were they, were they unwilling to... Oh, that night, the morning time we had about 140 mothers and children. In night time there were five. All had run to bush, take, just lifted the children and ran to bush. They were terrified. But then gradually they came in the morning and evening for feeding. They would come in for feeding and disappear again, get their medicines and go home. But now they're all back, things are back to normal. Day after day in Biafra, the unending search for food goes on. The village restaurants still display their grandiose names to the passers-by, but their prices have soared and their menus have shrunk almost to vanishing point. There's nothing to drink except palm wine, nothing to eat except some fruit and vegetables, and even to buy these you need a very well-filled purse. Prices in a Biafran food market today are famine prices. Since the war they've gone up pretty well beyond any control. A cup of this stuff, gary, which they make to use a sort of porridge, used to cost a penny a cup, now it costs a shilling. Or a yam, the staple food around here, like a big potato, used to cost sixpence each and now can cost anything from three shillings to a pound. Or a cup of salt, which is a very important commodity in a hot climate, used to cost a penny for a little cup like this and now costs 15 shillings. Matches used to cost tuppence a box and now cost five shillings. Or cigarettes, when you can get them, cost 13 and six for 10. That's over 25 shillings for 20. A bar of soap, like this used to cost a shilling before the war and now costs 25 shillings. This little heap of dried fish used to cost a penny before the war. You'd use it for flavouring or making soup. Now it costs 15 shillings. Or these lovely fellas here, 
a pile of snails. You could buy 30 of them for a shilling before the war, and now this lot, just seven, would cost you a pound. That is, if you happen to like snails. Fresh meat is pretty well unobtainable. You might be lucky to get a chicken, in which case it would cost you four pounds. But perhaps the most sought after of all is petrol. They call it liquid gold around here, and it costs in the black market 10 pounds a gallon. People still go to market, but these days they do it mainly from habit. Even if there were anything to buy, the prices would put it beyond the reach of all but the wealthiest. The market here at Nguru has an air of unreality about it, as though the real centre of action were somewhere else. And in fact, it is. About a quarter of a mile from the Nguru marketplace, there's a large convent and school, and it's here that the people come for their food, rather than to the once crowded market. The complete breakdown of the traditional system has left them entirely dependent on outside relief agencies like Caritas, the Red Cross and the World Council of Churches. This food centre begins operating shortly after six each morning and it has an average daily attendance of 3,000 women. This morning each one is given a piece of stockfish to begin with. These dried, salted codfish are probably the most useful of all the relief foods. They are light and easy to handle and they contain the vital protein that is lacking from the native food. The fish is followed by soup, made from vegetables bought locally. Since the Angora Feeding Centre is administered by nuns, most of their supplies come from Caritas, the Vatican Relief Agency. Every night, Caritas planes break the economic blockade and fly in food, medicine and money to the Earth trip at Uli. The stockfish comes in Caritas planes and so do the vitamin tablets distributed by Sister Conrad. For the women of Nguru, the Caritas planes are quite simply a matter of life and death. Just across the road from the women's centre, the sisters run another food centre for children and old people. The children begin to gather here while it's still dark, and by sunrise there are up to 4,000 of them. There are little bowls and basins ready to receive their one meal of the day. Today they're getting gary, a native food made from cassava roots, and powdered milk from Ireland. The children are supposed to form orderly lines and quietly await their turn to be served. But children are the same all over the world, and Mother Columba and her helpers are soon engulfed in a sea of bobbing brown heads. Order is not restored until it has been made quite clear to all concerned that the last scrap of Gary has been scraped from the last bucket, and that there is simply no more to be had. By nine o'clock the children are leaving the compound, and on the road outside they meet the last of the women returning from the other feeding centre. The women are happy, but they're also keeping an eye on the sun, because they know that when the sun is fully risen, the bombers come, and the bombers are no respecters of women or children, or for that matter, of convents. A recent air raid on the convent compound, just after the people had left, wrecked the children's clinic, killing a number of children and their nurse. Had finished the feeding. I was over in the college, I didn't know where the plane was going to drop discharge its load, but I did hear the explosion. I looked up and I heard the explosion. The convent was still there, but then towards this school, there was a cloud of smoke rising off to the sky. This so was down here? This was down here, so I suspected immediately that it was either the church or sister's clinic. When I came over here, the, of course, everybody was running helter-skelter. The Red Cross boys the sister had in the compound, I must say, were very good. They were helping, and the home guards, several of the home guards were helping, bringing out the bodies from under the debris. Many of them, including the staff nurse, who died later on in the day, was buried under the rubble. So they dragged out three bodies, children, 
And then several others were dug up, including an infant for about six months, who was dug up from under the rubble, but the child survived, thank God. We thought it would die, but it did not. There is a great deal of hatred towards the Federal Army. They're called the Vandals. How do you as a sister feel towards them? That's a hard question to answer. As a sister, well, I should not feel any hatred towards them. If I did, well, that will be just too bad. As an individual, I have no malice whatsoever against them. I feel that somehow or other, they just don't know what they are doing. But somebody behind them, left to themselves, they certainly wouldn't be capable of such unkindness. Do you regard this as actually as a civil war, or do you regard it as a, a war of one independent state against another? Well, for us, we don't call it a civil war. For Biafrans, it's a war of independence. We are fighting for our rights. We want to be independent because we feel that living with the others, certainly uh, we couldn't possibly live with them, together with them. We want them to stay, together, uh, stay on their own. We don't want to do them any harm. And if they leave us alone, that is all we want. 300 miles from Biafra, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, lies the tropical island of San Tome. It was discovered by Portuguese explorers 500 years ago, and it's remained Portuguese ever since. Nothing much else has ever happened here, and the pace of life was distinctly leisurely up to March 1968, the month when Caritas decided to make San Tome Airport the base for its relief flights into Biafra. Warehouses were rented, planes were flown in, and pilots were recruited who were willing to make the dangerous nighttime flight over hostile territory to the airstrip at Uli in Biafra. The airport in Biafra is pretty primitive. What are the problems for a pilot landing there? Well, the, uh, let's say the blackness for one thing, your, your lack of uh, any reference for depth perception for getting in. The runway is so narrow that uh, it looks longer than it really is. However, it was plenty long. It's, I think, over 7,800 feet long, but uh, being as narrow as it is, it uh, is, a, let's say, a psychological problem. But in fact, they don't switch on the landing lights. Uh, and when do they switch them on? When we were coming in, they hardly seemed to be on at all. Well, they're not. Uh, they, they turn them off for every... Uh, as soon as the plane lands, the lights are turned off, and they're not turned on again until uh, the next plane reports that he is on final. And if uh, they don't turn them on, you don't find the runway. Have you been experienced any of the bombing uh, on the runways while you were down? I was uh, there the night of the first night air raid on the ground, uh, but the bombs must have landed a mile or so away. It was oh. either four or six of them, I don't know. But some of your fellow pilots weren't so lucky. About two weeks later, there was a, a bomb attack. Uh, one of our captains was wounded. Co-pilot was badly wounded. Father McGlade was wounded. Uh, the Red Cross man over there was wounded, and uh, I think there was about 12 Biafrans killed. I've heard several figures, and 20 or 30 wounded. Well, this is principally why you're so anxious to get airborne again. Yes. So we like, offer less uh, time for target. How many flights in a night do you make? You mean each individual pilot? Mm. Well, the normal is two, and we've got something like, say, stockfish, something fast unloading. I have made three. How would this compare with the ordinary civil flying? Well, you're uh, pretty tired at the end of three shuttles because you've got an awful lot of duty time. So sitting here, waiting to be loaded, being offloaded. So it, say so you fly maybe say 10 hours in a one night, you've got uh, four more hours of waiting for loading and unloading. Are you insured? No. Why? The premiums would be prohibitive. The first plane takes off at about half past five by Afrin time, and by the time it reaches the Nigerian coast, it's dark. The darkness poses problems for the pilot, but it also gives protection against the Nigerian anti-aircraft guns and fighter planes. The Nigerian government has consistently tried to stop the relief airlift and has accused Caritas of flying in guns and ammunition. No evidence has ever been produced for these accusations and Caritas officials firmly deny that their planes carry anything except relief supplies to Biafra.
Inside Biafra, the supplies are transported to the Caritas Distributing Centre at Ihoma. A fleet of 26 heavy lorries are waiting here to bring them to the different camps and feeding centres. All the fuel for these lorries has also to be flown in, as well as tyres, batteries and other spare parts. The distribution system is very efficient, mainly because in the missionaries it has a network of local agents who cover the whole country, who are familiar with the people and the conditions they live in, and who are able to direct the relief supplies with the minimum of delay to the places where they're most badly needed. This is Mbutakaya, a small village on the southern zone of the Biafran war front. Mbutakaya has changed hands several times in the past few months. It's part of Biafra now, but the Federal Army is only about three miles away down that road, and there was continuous firing, shelling and machine gun fire last night for four hours, so its future is very much in the balance. Here in the Catholic Mission, there are 1,560 registered refugees, families who have left their homes in Port Harcourt and in the towns around there in front of the advancing Federal Army. They depend for their livelihood on whatever food they can obtain locally and for the relief supplies which come in from the airstrip irregularly. It's in a place like Mbutakaya that one sees the effects of war at their grimmest. The 1,500 refugees who are staying in the school buildings have been living like hunted animals for the past six months. When the federal troops advance, they flee into the bush. When they retreat, days or weeks later, the people return again. No outside food has reached them for most of this period, and they've been living on what they could find in the bush, fruit, roots, leaves, and an occasional vegetable. Many have died, especially children and old people. Today, a small truckload of dried fish has come to the village the first food to come here since the federal troops retreated a week ago. The ration is one dried fish for each family. <laughs> Father Mick Wallace is the priest in charge at Mbutakaya. When he came back to his house this time, he found it stripped completely bare. Even the water tank, pierced by bullets, was empty. <laughs> The lorry that brought the fish will not go back empty. The driver, Father Dahani, will inspect all the children in the camp and select the worst cases to be brought away for treatment. <laughs> Father Dahani makes his selection. The names are written down and the parents, if they can be found, are asked for their consent. The children will be loaded into the back of the truck and bounced along 20 miles of jungle tracks to the Kwashiorkor Clinic. There won't be room for all of them at the clinic, and some will be sent abroad to Caritas camps in San Tome or Gabon or Ivory Coast. But first, each child's name is written on a piece of plaster and stuck on his forehead to avoid later confusion. One of the mothers is to go with the children and to sign the necessary forms on behalf of all the parents. Do you agree to that? We have agreed. All of them. In the Nine. You, you have three children of your own, but I want you to look after also these other children. You must know their names and know their mothers. Father Wallace, you've been overrun here by the Federal Army. What's no, the likelihood of you're actually being cut off here? It's not likely. Why? No, because uh, there are very several roads that I can take into the uh, interior of the country, like into away from the front, so that I'm no danger really as long as I have a car with some petrol in it. I only have a few personal things in the house. I can I have them keep them in the suitcase all the time, so that if there is any danger. 
if the federal army should make a sudden burst in, uh, I just uh, put the things in the case, put them into the car, called the boy, and away. Not even bother locking the door. Have you had deaths from starvation down here, malnutrition? Oh, plenty, especially of older women, died in the marketplace out there. And uh, some even stayed there when the Federal Army were moving in. Old women, old men, I saw some of them there. I gave them a few pounds as I was passing out myself. I asked them if they were going to uh, move. They said no, that uh, they'd stay here. I don't know what happened to them. I know a lot of them died. But they're not around anymore? I don't see them now. You see, the people shift around so much, you can't exactly know uh, where they are at any particular time. You lose contact very quick with anybody that you might know, that you might be trying to help. You'd see an old woman today, and tomorrow you'd have something. You'd want to know where she was gone to. Nobody could find her. In the church at Uzaba, the final selection of the children takes place. Word has just come through that there's a Red Cross plane flying in tonight from Gabon, which will be able to take 50 children on its way back. Some of the children from Abutakaya will be on the plane, together with others who have been examined by the sister doctor and found fit enough to make the long journey. Cyril Onyeneke. Cyril Onyeneke. Peter Opera. Peter Opera. For each child going abroad, a long form has to be filled out in quadruplicate and signed by the parents or the parents' representative. If they can't write, their right thumbprint takes the place of a signature. What is her name? Bibiana Akota. Age? Four years. Your hometown? Emekuku. Village. According to the small print on the form, the parent agrees that his child be evacuated outside Biafra for treatment and care, be medically operated on if necessary, and be buried abroad in the event of death. Akuta. Livinus Akuta. Akuta, yes. Can you sign? Yes. Thank you. When the formalities have been completed, the children are taken inside the altar rails and put sitting on the steps of the altar, an action which is not without a certain symbolic significance. Separated from their fathers and mothers, Viviana and her companions are now the responsibility of Caritas. Before they leave for the airstrip, each child is given a numbered medal for purposes of identification. Almost 3,000 children have so far been taken out of the country by Caritas, and it's necessary to keep accurate records of every one. For the purposes of the journey, Bibiana Akuta has become number 66. The chain is firmly fastened, and she'll not be able to remove it until she reaches her destination. The children will travel to the airstrip in two small pickups, 25 in each. Many of them have legs so badly swollen that they have to be lifted into the van. But these children are the lucky ones. For them, the future holds some hope. For those who stay behind, hope is something that grows dimmer every day. In a few more weeks, the local yams and cassavas will all have been eaten, and the next harvest will be six months away. The supplies brought in by the relief planes will no longer be a supplement to the native food. They will be all the food there is. When that day comes, it will bring starvation more widespread and terrible than anything that has gone before. Colonel Adamedu Juku has been president of Biafra and commander-in-chief of its army since independence was declared. He, more than any other man, is aware of the famine threatening his people and grateful for any help that reaches them from outside. Your Excellency, one of the greatest relief campaigns ever mounted by the Irish people has been mounted in the past few months on behalf of Biafra through Caritas. What effect have these airlifts had on the Biafran people? I think it has been a tremendous work. 
and may I, if you permit me, take this opportunity to thank the Irish people, particularly as this is intended for them, for their generosity, for their deep understanding and humanity, for their practical help in a time of such great travail. It is gestures and help of this kind that builds lasting friendship. We are very grateful today, tomorrow, and forever our people will be grateful. Irish missionaries were recently accused by members of the federal government of gun running and more recently of organizing mercenaries. Would you like to comment on these charges? Quite idiotic, absolutely. Um, I don't know whether in fact anybody takes such an accusation seriously. It is the fluster of a frustrated people and one can understand their frustration after all the massive support they're getting and finding they cannot conduct their quick kill. It is an accusation just made because they are not advancing in the battlefield. No reverend father, no missionary serves in Biafra as a mercenary or organizing one or indeed doing anything directly to aid our war effort. All the Irish missionaries have done and indeed the missionaries on this side have done is their Christian duty of bringing hope, of bringing solicitude, of bringing relief to the afflicted people. That's all. Since the War of Independence began, uh, most of the Irish missionaries have in fact remained here in Biafra. And how do you feel about this? To me, it's natural. A missionary comes in. It's like a wedding, for better or for worse. Right now, it's worse. And they stay with us. Um, I never thought for one moment that they would leave, and I am happy that they have not left. Our entire people are happy. The Irish government, however, have not recognized officially the state of Biafra. How do you interpret this? Governments are usually slow in matters such as this. I interpret the reticence of the Irish government as arising from a lack of conviction that a recognition of Biafra at this stage is to her own interest. The people of Ireland have demonstrated their own feeling in this matter, but governments are always slow. I think that it's a good start that the people are understanding. This understanding by the people, I hope, soon will be transmitted to their accredited representatives and the government. We would very much, of course, like to see a more positive action, diplomatically and politically, from the Irish government. Your Excellency, it's now over 18 months since this war began. Do you have any regrets now about the secession of Biafra? Give me a thousand opportunities again, I will do precisely what I have done. You have only to look at my people, go out to the streets and look at them and see exactly what they feel about the situation. I am today in a happy position of knowing that I have acted absolutely throughout according to the wishes of my people. No, I have no regrets. There can be no doubt that the people of Biafra are behind their leader. Soldiers sing the name of Ajuku as they march along. They may not be winning the war against Nigeria, but at least they're no longer losing it. The war against hunger, however, is going less well. 
Among the craftsmen of Biafra, only the coffin makers are prospering. Business has been brisk indeed over the past six months, and it will become brisker still as the local food supplies are exhausted and the impossibility of feeding a whole people by a nightly airlift becomes apparent. Oh, impossible. After all, we are roughly 10 million in an area the size of Munster. And you couldn't possibly, as Caritas Internationalis have clearly said, we can't feed 10 million people. We can help you. Well, this means certain famine. All then. this means starvation, utter and complete starvation. Even Oxfam, even representatives from England have said within the past week that they estimate that 2 million people would die at the end of two months. And that's not over-exaggerated. As a matter of fact, I insist again, and I've written it several times, you couldn't over-exaggerate the hunger problem. You couldn't. Well, can you see no solution then to this at all? The only solution is the one that we have proposed all the time, and that is a ceasefire. After all, there are ports at Port Harcourt, there are ports in Calabar. If shiploads could be brought in, then you could feed the people, but you will never feed them by a nightly airlift. On the island of San Tome, the warehouses are busy from morning to night. The airlift pioneered by Caritas has attracted help from many quarters. The World Council of Churches now bears the cost of every second night, and the two organizations work in close cooperation using the same pilots and planes. Supplies come from many sources, with the Catholic Relief Services of America taking the place of honor. Ireland's Joint Biafra Famine Appeal, England's Oxfam, Germany's Miserior, are other organizations that have contributed generously. The International Red Cross have mounted a similar airlift from the island of Fernando Po. Biafra's desperate struggle against starvation seems to have touched the hearts and consciences of the whole world. It's an amazing achievement to have sprung from such modest beginnings, and no one is more surprised at it than the man who started it all, Father Tony Byrne, the priest who came to Africa to preach and baptize and ended up directing an airline instead. Father Tony Byrne, last March you organized the airlifting of 60 tonnes of food from Lisbon to Sao Tome, and this seems to be the beginning of the airlifting of food. Yes, actually this was the beginning. I came here last March to start the operation. Um, I didn't think at that time that it was possible for this operation to develop into the world's greatest relief operation. Uh, we had 60 tonnes come down here by boat and later on we transported to Biafra. We thought then this was a wonderful achievement. Looking back on it now, since last March we have airlifted 850 tonnes of, uh, a big pardon, 850 airlifts with about 10.5 tonnes on each plane. This business of, of the church actually buying planes, if you could charter planes, then why did you actually buy them? Well, you see, at that time, no company would come into this operation. They consider it as an extremely dangerous operation, so it is. But uh, they were not at all interested. We had to buy planes in order to prove to these companies that it was worthwhile coming into this operation. Transair Sweden, Transavia, Fred Olsen, and all the other companies, some of the planes you see here, these have come into the operation after we had bought the planes. You mean simply financially worthwhile? Yes, financially worthwhile and also, you know, then some people thought that Biafra was only a, a very, it would only last a very short time and therefore it wasn't worthwhile bringing planes down here. But in fact, it has been worthwhile for these people. When, uh, how much does it cost to keep the planes running actually? I mean, to, to have your own planes at $75,000 each was quite a, a purchase, yes. but to keep them running. Well, to charter one plane from here to Biafra cost me $2,900. And we have, as I say, chartered 850 so far, so the operation is extremely costly. But I think it's money well spent because life is sacred. And we are serving not the government or the army, we are serving the army civilian population, the women and the children who are starving and who are depending on our food. We believe that these children have a right to live. They have committed no crime. They know nothing about ideas like uh, economic blockade, secession, or independent, independence. All they know is that they are very, very hungry, and they need food and need it urgently. And we feel that we have a moral obligation to keep these people alive.
Since this airlift started, you've had two crashes, four pilots killed yes. the other day. Have you yes. any regrets that you started this enterprise? No, I think that some people must die to save nine million people to live. And I think that in saving people to live, we must be ready to die. Captain McCormy, an English pilot, spoke to me a week ago. And he said, Father, even though the night raids at the airport in Biafra are very serious, we must continue to fly supplies to these starving people. And he said, I am prepared to lose my life in doing this work. Last Sunday, he lost his life, and I had to go to his wife and his young family and to the wives of the other pilots and tell them the sad news. This has been a big sorrow for us, and I hope and pray that we won't have, have this accident or any other accident again. It's night time at San Tome Airport. The planes are beginning to arrive back from their first shuttle to Biafra. Lorries laden with milk powder are standing by, and as soon as the plane is stationary, the loading begins. A cargo like this, which can be loaded and offloaded in a matter of minutes, enables the same plane to make three round trips to Uli before dawn. It's been a very quiet night so far, with no bombing or anti-aircraft fire reported from Biafra. One plane failed to make radio contact at Uli and had to return without landing. Another burst a tire on landing and is on its way back to San Tome with only three wheels operational. But these are considered pretty minor problems on the Uli run. While the planes are reloading, their crews have a cup of coffee or a snack in the airport restaurant. They're often joined by wives and friends, drawn irresistibly by the excitement of the place. The other plane didn't come back. It's very late. Back. Yes, uh, he uh, ran into some problem with his landing gear and uh, actually a tire burst and uh, they have to take a wheel off and yeah. bring it in on three wheels. It's a tough it's not, it's not very good. Yeah. The loading is finished. The tanks are refilled. The plane moves off into the darkness. All over Biafra, people are waiting, listening for the sound of the engines, the sound that brings terror by day, hope by night. In their hour of trial, they know that they have not been completely forgotten by the rest of the world. They know that men have died in order that they may live. Perhaps the one solution to their problems, a just and lasting peace, is nearer than it seems. In the meantime, for all its inadequacy, the night flight to Uli remains a beacon of light and hope in one of the darkest places of the world. <laughs> <laughs>